The following has been taken from the Toth Tarot, Astrology, and Other Selected Readings by Phyllis Seckler, Sorrel Merrill, edited by David Shoemaker, Gregory Peters, and Rorick Johnson. The Emperor All these old letters of my book are aright, but Zadi is not the star. This also is secret. My prophet shall reveal it to the wise. Liber Legis, Chapter 1, Verse 57 With the trump of the emperor, we come again to that switch of trumps which is so puzzling to many students of tarot. An explanation of this switch occurs in ITC, Volume 2, Number 3, so I shan't repeat it here. First, let us notice that Nuit calls the tarot her book with a capital letter to reveal its importance. In Liber Legis itself, there are many passages that relate very well to the trumps, and wherever possible, these have been quoted. It takes some study to realize and accept the switch of the emperor to Zadi and of the star to He. This is why this matter is revealed to the wise. Crowley did not accept the switch right away. It took many years before he was ready to write the Book of Toth, where the switch is shown, but not completely. So in many writings by A.C., the switch does not show up at all. The emperor takes a new path and a new relationship to the spheres and to other paths. This trump signifies law and order a regulation imposed on the chaotic forces of nature or on one's own inner chaos, which exists in the unconscious. His work with the conscious mind imposes rule on unconscious forces and on the forces of nature surrounding him. This trump is attributed to Aries, which is a fiery sign and also cardinal. The cardinal signs initiate action, and since Aries is ruled by Mars, this action is of a pioneering sort with ambition and intelligence. We study the planet Mars and the tower, how its effect of activity, movement, energy can lead to destruction so that there is room for a new birth. But this energy can be harnessed by the rule of the mind. And this is what the emperor is doing as he sits upon his throne, king and ruler over all that surrounds him. You have 90, and it means fish hook. This fish hook is used to catch a fish. The fish is associated with mercury and with water. This planet, Mercury, rules the mind and the intelligence. It is a suggestion that the mind of the emperor is used to control the runaway energy of Mars and of the first zodiac sign of spring, Aries. The signification of water helps to keep the fire of Mars in some sort of balance. Fire and water are polarities. Water signifies the mysterious action of unconscious forces. Dreams of water almost invariably spell out what is going on in the unconscious. The emperor has used a fish hook to bring up these forces from the vastness of the unconscious, and as each new force surfaces, he remains the ruler of it all, fully in control. The emperor has the attribution of the constituting intelligence, to constitute means to compose, to form, to make or create, to appoint to an office or function, to establish laws, to give legal form to a court or other institution, etc. All these functions are descriptive of the actions of the emperor. He is the author of a way of life as related to Aries. He is also an originator, a founder, a begetter, a paternal figure. He is the architect of a way of life and a builder of forms, whether material or mental, of those things that make the way of life a law. It is the action of thinking of Mercury which defines something and thus to name it. This leads to self-consciousness and conscious thinking. What, what has been fished out of the unconscious now becomes subject to the laws of the conscious mind. But in the past aeon, in which the paternal forces had the uppermost hand in society, many injustices occurred. 
Too much rule led to repression, not only of the freedom of man, but of unconscious forces. In revenge, these unconscious forces would rise up from time to time, and a whole nation would go insane. The repression of freedom and of unconscious forces led to Hitler's Germany and Stalin's Russia, and now in the Near East this is showing again. It also has its downside in the rule of dictators around the world. Their rule does not work for very long because they shut out the feminine side of nature, the unconscious forces, and they seek to impose their own rule on others who do not accept this rule at all. Everywhere the people are fighting for freedom from repressive rules. We can begin to see this, why the emperor has been demoted to a lower part of the tree. The paternal age is over and he no longer holds sway over the mores and actions of humanity. The king no longer defines the rule of God. As though to keep his powers in check and to place him in the right relationship to the whole of the powers of the unconscious, the emperor is now placed between two feminine spheres. Above him is Netzach, the sphere of Venus and of love. Below him is Yesod, the sphere of the moon, the foundation of life that exists in unknown realms in the unconscious. Each of us has a lawgiver in ourselves. The lawgiver, or the director of unknown forces, is like an engine driver. The engine can be made to go along a track and thus obey the rule of the conscious mind. And when this is done, the power is very forceful. But this power must be balanced by the unconscious, the dreams and visions, artistic pursuits, music, love, the actions of the autonomic nervous system, and much more. Flow any of the forces of unconscious life, and it will lead to nothing but trouble and a malfunctioning of the whole human. The trouble with the emperor or the king of the past and the king in each of us is that the small ego claims to be the whole of the human. But this is not the case. The conscious mind is only a tool to be used for material ends at the present, to make life more comfortable, or to achieve the aims of the will. The conscious mind must also be used to a certain extent and to its limits in order to achieve illumination, even though that state is quite beyond any conscious will or thinking. Each person must make sure that his conscious mind, which we may call the engine driver or the powers of the unconscious, does not give conflicting directions to his engine. This is why will must be one-pointed. Most people are a mass of conflicting suggestions. They want this or they want that. A host of unnecessary aims and ambitions. As a result, their engine has no track and goes wild and berserk through life with plenty of mishaps and accidents along the way. The forces of the unconscious can be faithful servants once the person has harnessed himself to one aim. What he wills comes to pass. It may not be what he wants, but it is will be his true will working itself out. To that he is wedded, and for that he must strive and work. Every time he strays from this direction in life, he will be dealt blows to straighten him out and to lead to his realization of his true purpose and his true will. Whenever a new turning comes into our lives or a difficult event has taken our attention and our emotional reactions, Whenever we sorrow or hate or entertain a host of negative emotions, it is a sign that we need to stop and take stock and evaluate what is our true will and try to get ourselves back on track, hitched to our star. Dreams and visions are a great aid in trying to understand just what is going on. Nightmares are a warning that we have lost our way. When we get back on the track of our true wills, and our inner selves have a right to manifestation, it will be surprising how many matters and events will fall into place. Almost without our consciously willing it, the right event will take place and lead us to further success and triumphs. What has happened is that our unknown and unrecognized powers have taken over and are obeying the instructions of the engine driver. 
If a person upsets this delicate balance between conscious and unconscious by various behaviors, notably alcohol and drug addiction, or abuse of any substance or unduly allowed influence of other people so that one becomes bewildered, then that person must expect to suffer until he writes himself and pays attention to the dictates of his own will. The sun is exalted in Aries and gives light and power, vitality and health, rank, title, rulership, and authority. The emperor has all these qualities. Behind his head is a symbol of the radiant sun. On either side of his throne are two suns with stars pictured within. A sun is a star in the heavens. This signifies the force of our own individual stars. If they shine in us, we rule our environment and our thoughts and emotions. Our own star is a symbol of our own holy guardian angel. An Aries person is a natural ruler and likes to rule and guide others, but as mentioned above with this direction, he makes a mistake. He should rule and guide himself. The rams, which are symbols of Aries, are shown on either side of the emperor's throne, and another appears on his staff of office. He has a philosophical mind and is interested in science. His throne is a cube which symbolizes cosmic law and order. If it wasn't for these laws, we would have chaos. He is equated with the great architect of the universe who imposes law and order on the movement of the stars, the formation and dissolution of galaxies and all else in the universe. The Greeks thought of this figure as the supreme nos, or reasoning intelligent both of the universe and of man. He represents spiritual and magical and physical law. As a reasoning mind, he equates with inductive action whereby false notions are overthrown by careful thought and experience. Though he represents mental activity in the human and is classified as rational, he can also be sudden, violent, and exhibit an impermanent energy quite within the scope of the forces of Mars. He holds an orb and cross, which mean absolute dominion over life and nature. The orb is like the circle in that it can be a symbol of eternity. The cross is a symbol of the opposing forces that bring about life and action. Also, the orb is a symbol of the roundness of the earth and the forms of stars. The shield beside the emperor has a two-headed eagle as its central theme. Behind the heads of the eagle is a form of the sun. This is an ancient alchemical and Masonic symbol. It signifies the polarity of forces essential to manifested life. The trump of the empress also has a two-headed eagle on a shield, but hers are white while his are red. She is a symbol of the moon and feminine forces, and he is a symbol of maleness and of the sun. These two figures are connected in alchemical terms. The emperor represents sulfur, and the empress represents salt. Their union brings about the manifestations of life and phenomena. While the empress represents love and feelings, dreams and instincts, the unconscious words that is the true source of all that we know in our conscious minds, the emperor represents the law and order of the intellect, which he imposes on the feminine world. He is the objective world of our outer facts and forces. We each must learn to keep a balance between them as these forces operate in each individual. When first learning this balance, it must be accepted that these forces operate as alternating currents, first one, then the other. It is only to the adept who has attained that state called above the abyss that these forces operate simultaneously. The empress's mother and nourisher the young. This is also true as of yet unborn ideas and behaviors. The empress is placed high on the tree between Chokmah and Bina, between the true will and wisdom of Chokmah and nascent forms and understanding of Bina. Her function is to nourish an idea before it can spring into intellectual activity. If we fritter away her powers by talking too soon of what we intend, then we ruin the as-yet-unborn thought or activity. 
The clear spring of ideas welling up from the unconscious can be run by the intellectual activity of the emperor who rules the conscious life and talk. Speaking before action takes place dissolves the power of the activity. Many people fritter away this power by talk and can then be accounted as very poor magicians. We must wait for a later stage when various vague forms of thoughts can be brought together into a united whole before we begin to intellectualize, prune, or refine what is happening within our inner depths. If our inner emperor is too rigid and demanding and unreceptive, he can imprison us in a world of finished ideas. This happens to some short-sighted scientist or with the proper attitudes this inner emperor can be relaxed and energetic and imaginative, and he can aid the process of creativity by balancing this conscious mind activity with the unconsciousness signified by the empress. The powers of the emperor must always be balanced or these powers become a rule of tyranny. The domestic lamb at the feet of the emperor suggests this taming of the wild powers of the rams at his head. There is Fior de Lis at his feet. These are sexual symbols and indicate the power of his male energy. The spirals on his robe hint at the direction of such energies, developing into the power of going, which is in a spiral fashion. This power is balanced by the significance of the bees, also in the design of his robe. Bees are purely feminine as a symbol. The hive gets rid of the male members as soon as the queen is mated, and when she begins to reproduce, the hive is all female. The energies of the female bees make the honey and nourish the young. This has a parallel in the fungi kind. Finally, from the Book of Thoth, we have this. Use all thine energy to rule thy thought. Burn up thy phoenix. Sire and inceptor, emperor and king, of all things mortal, hail him, Lord of Spring. In the name of the Lord of Initiation. Amen. I fly, and I alight as a hawk, a mother of emerald are my mighty sweeping wings. I swoop down upon the black earth, and it gladdens into green at my coming. Children of earth, rejoice. Rejoice exceedingly, for your salvation is at hand. The end of sorrow is come. I will ravish you away into my unutterable joy. I will kiss you and bring you to the bridal. I will spread a feast before you in the house of happiness. I am not come to rebuke you or to enslave you. I bid you not turn from your voluptuous ways, from your idleness, from your follies. But I bring you joy to your pleasure, peace to your languor, wisdom to your folly. All that ye do is right, if so be that ye enjoy it. I come against sorrow, against weariness, against them that seek to enslave you. I pour you lustral wine that giveth you delight both at the sunset and the dawn. Come with me, and I will give you all that is desirable upon the earth. Because I give you that of which earth and its joys are but as shadows. They flee away, but my joy abideth even unto the end. I have hidden myself beneath a mask. I am a black and terrible God. With courage conquering fear shall ye approach me. Ye shall lay down your heads upon mine altar, expecting the sweep of the sword. But the first kiss of love shall be radiant on your lips, and all my darkness and terror shall turn to light and joy. Only those who fear shall fail those who have bent their backs to the yoke of slavery until they can no longer stand upright. Them will I despise. But you who have defied the law, you who have conquered by subtlety or force, you will I take unto me, even I will take you unto me. 
I ask you to sacrifice nothing at mine altar. I am the God who giveth all. Light, life, love, force, fantasy, fire. These do I bring you. Mine hands are full of these. There is a joy in the setting out. There is a joy in the journey. There is a joy in the goal. Only if you are sorrowful or weary or angry or discomforted, then ye may know that ye have lost the golden thread, the thread wherewith I guide you to the heart of the groves of Eleusis. My disciples are proud and beautiful. They are strong and swift. They rule their way like mighty conquerors. The weak, the timid, the imperfect, the cowardly, the poor and tearful. These are mine enemies, and I am come to destroy them. This also is compassion, an end to the sickness of earth, a rooting out of the weeds, a watering of the flowers. O oh, my children, ye are more beautiful than the flowers, ye must not fade in your season. I love you. I would sprinkle you with the divine dew of immortality. This immortality is no vain hope beyond the grave. I offer you the certain consciousness of bliss. I offer it at once, on earth, before an hour has struck upon the bell. Ye shall be with me in the abodes that are beyond decay. Also I give you power, earthly, and joy, earthly, wealth and health and length of days. Adoration and love shall cling to your feet and twine around your heart. Only your mouth shall drink of a delicious wine, the wine of Iacchus. They shall reach ever to the heavenly kiss of the beautiful God. I reveal unto you a great mystery. You stand between the abyss of height and the abyss of depth. And either awaits you a companion, and that companion is yourself. You can have no other companion. Many have arisen, being wise. They have said, seek out the glittering image in the place ever golden, and unite yourself with it. Many have arisen, being foolish. They have said, stoop down into the darkly splendid world and be wedded to that blind creature of the slime. I, who am beyond wisdom and folly, arise and say unto you, achieve both weddings, unite yourself with both. Beware, beware, I say, lest ye seek after the one and lose the other. My adepts stand upright, their heads above the heavens and their feet below the hills. But since one is naturally attracted to the angel and another to the demon, let the first strengthen the lower link, the last attach more firmly to the higher. Thus, shall equilibrium become perfect. I will aid my disciples as fast as they acquire this balanced power, and joy so faster will I push them. They shall, in their turn, speak from this invisible throne. Their words shall illumine the worlds. They shall be masters of majesty and might. They shall be beautiful and joyous. They shall be clothed with victory and splendor. They shall stand upon the firm foundation. The kingdom shall be theirs. Yea, the kingdom shall be theirs. In the name of the Lord of Initiation. Amen.